so um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Torres, and I'm here on behalf of my team to present our work on handwritten historical music recognition. And first and foremost, this is the outline of what I'm going to uh, talk about during my presentation. Um, first, I shall introduce the topic. I will discuss the methodology that we have chosen to tackle it. And we will show the results that we have obtained during our experiments. And finally, we will draw a few conclusions and talk a little bit about the future work that this, um, that this uh, paper uh, leads to. So first and foremost, um, why would we try to recognize um, handwritten scores? Um, the main reason is that there are many of uh, ancient handwritten scores scattered throughout the world. Um, uh, there are too many of them to transcribe them manually. Therefore, OMR is a very nice solution for that problem. And it is especially relevant because many of these scores that we, uh, we don't really know anything about, they're either unpublished or they have never been studied because they are mostly stored in archives, for instance, in churches throughout Europe. And um, for this work, we were provided with a few of these um, church uh, samples. Uh, which were written by Paul Inas, the Kapellmeister of a church in, in Barcelona called Santa Maria del Pi. And these, um, uh, these scores, uh, even if they are very nicely written and put together, um, they offer a very wide array of difficulties to transcribe. Um, more relevantly, um, when we can easily see some text over the staff or overlapping symbols in, in general, not only text, we can find some lines which are in the middle of, uh, of nowhere or um, uh, crossing strike throughs, um, stuff like this. And we can also find many non-standard segments. So overall, it is a very difficult problem, uh, which kind of complicates the whole lack of annotated, uh, sorry, the whole lack of study on these documents. How did we tackle this? Um, the first step, I think we've uh, seen a few models which do a similar task, is treat music as a sequence instead of a, you know, a bidirectional um, graph or a bidirectional uh, system, notation system. And this can be done just by uh, describing a, a reading order. With this, we can exploit the uh, sequential nature of music uh, with the way the, the ground truth is annotated, and we can also exploit um, the fact that we are not going to need uh, bounding boxes. We can use basically OCR or HTR models, which work very well uh, for these kinds of situations. Finally, in order to reduce the amount of classes, we split symbols into primitives in the same agnostic way that has been described so far. So uh, every note head, every component of a note will be divided by its, comp its minimal components. Um, so in a way, um, BLSTMs, which are a, a very good model and are the current state of the art, we have found that it might be, uh, so uh, Western music notation, uh, fully fledged Western music notation in a handwritten context might be too complex to be tackled with this model. So um, we propose to use in its stead uh, the sequence to sequence model, which we have found to perform very well in HDR tasks and is very naturally fit for sequential data as its name implies. And the idea I shall describe um, in the following slides, but first I will uh, quickly go over the baseline model. It's the same CRNN plus CTC uh, loss model that we've seen before. So it's a bidirectional stack of recurrent um, uh, units, uh, sorry, uh, LSTMs that process an input uh, feature map from a CNN and then classify uh, column wise and get the output. The sequence to sequence model is a little bit more involved uh, in the sense that we first feed the image of the, um, the input image and generate a feature mount from a CNN. In this case, it's a BGG19 with the max, last max pooling layer removed for reasons that I'm going to um, mention uh, uh, soon. And then this first feature map gets processed by a bidirectional gated recurring unit stack into a hidden state with the same dimensionality. The idea is that uh, with this step, we can generate a very well-informed uh, hidden, um, hidden, um, hidden state, which contains contextual information um, considering the whole image. So um, this hidden state, however, um, includes all the out possible outputs from each gated recruitment unit. So it's very, very um, information intensive. And this is where the attention mechanism comes in. And the attention mechanism, um, uh, once the first 
input uh, process has finished. We'll then wait for every uh, decoder step. Um, we'll wait all the vectors in the hidden state and uh, using a sigmoid uh, output layer. So um, we will have a distribu probability distribution of which are the most relevant uh, vectors. And when sum together, they will sum one. And with this, we can form a context vector that uh, is the, um, the uh, only uh, piece of information we need to perform inference uh, at the decoder. The decoder, uh, in the end, is basically a, a language model. It's a gated recurring unit stack with, um, uh, instead of having a prior based only on the previous, um, on the previous uh, token, we influence it with the visual features. And with that, we generate the, the, the output sequence. So um, in a way, what we're doing is assuming that the convolutional neural network um, provides order information. We're basically as um, soft aligning, in a way, uh, the visual input features with the output features. Uh, however, the data set that we were provided with um, is very small. So the handwritten samples that we have amount to about 250 overall at a measure level. And we then have to split them into approximately 100 uh, train, 100 uh, validation, and 50 test. This is, of course, insufficient for such a data hungry model. Instead, what we're going to do is introduce uh, synthetic um, samples, both uh, polyphonic of uh, without any kind of distortion and with distortion to mimic uh, paper degradation. So um, right outside the box, the results that we obtain with the architecture training uh, with these uh, combinations of data sets and performing tests on the handwritten data set are the following. Um, the best results are of course training with historical, but the problem is that uh, being such a small data set, we can safely assure that even with the CNN and plus BLSTM and the sequence to sequence model, um, these are bound to be overfitted. And if we train uh, in both cases with the uh, synthetic um, data sets that we crafted for, for this work, we can see that um, it is kind of hard to obtain good results because um, uh, there is uh, quite a, a wide rift between both, uh, between both score styles. Uh, note, however, that I didn't mention it earlier, we uh, apply uh, data augmentation on training. Uh, I think uh, that we apply uh, some um, perspective distortion and some um, paper degradation on top of whatever the, the sample included. So um, in any case, all samples that we're going to feed are not completely identical, even if they are, um, there are not many of them. Thus, in order to try and prove results, um, we employed a cur curriculum learning strategy. First and foremost, um, we started training the sequence to sequence model using a very low percentage of historical samples and a very large percentage of modern samples. And we would increase the historical percentage as we would decrease the other. Um, the idea is that uh, we would uh, try to accustom the model uh, to more complex samples and try to avoid overfitting towards historical ones alone. And in order to prevent uh, overfitting, we would do the opposite in validation to try and get a model that can do both uh, correctly. And the final test that we obtained doing that, uh, similar rate, uh, is of about 31.8%, uh, improving results uh, quite considerably and overcoming the current baseline using um, BLSTMs, uh, sorry, um, CTC plus BLSTMs. So, few qualitative results. Um, basically, there are many symbols such as slurs, which can be confused with flags, especially with this style of flag. And one of the most uh, usual mistakes are pitches, uh, wrong pitches, a few uh, steps uh, ahead uh, or below. And the most complicated samples are those which are very uh, stuffed uh, with uh, symbols or that have higher and lower lines, uh, a little bit uh, cropped into the, the image. And mostly in these cases, we will we are going to have very high similar rate results. So we have uh, experimentally demonstrated that this model obtains very promising results, and the that the generation of synthetic data and the curriculum learning strategies do help in improving the results. And uh, some future work avenues that we have studied include including a language model to this architecture, which um, we have found it to improve results uh, up to 25% of similar rate. And this is a publication submitted to Izmir that will be published soon. 
and other uh, roads uh, incorporating domain adaptation uh, using unsupervised pre-training or perhaps um, tackling polyphonic handwritten scores are some interesting roads to continue with this model. This is everything from my side, so I'll be very glad to answer any questions you might have. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul, for this very interesting presentation. Questions from the audience? Clap, clap, clap. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? It's here. Go ahead. Okay. I, the, the, I don't know. Any, I didn't know anything about curriculum training or learning. Uh, so I understood about the training part. So what do you test with? The, 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 that's what I didn't get. I mentioned that we are only testing with handwritten samples exclusively. So the 50 or so samples of the uh, handwritten data set I show. So for every like level, because you were increasing the training data, for example, in the very left column, I saw the historic one increasing, right? Yes. And then you had your test result on the very right. So the test data set is always the same? Is that what Correct. you're saying? Ah, Correct. Okay, thank you. And I didn't mention it, but just for clarification, uh, every single result in that uh, slide is cumulative. So the first one, the first model, so the second row builds up on the model trained in the first row and so on and so forth. One question from my side, uh, if there are no other questions so far. Um, do you think it's because you um, started to introduce this reading order, like going right and going down? Um, a, can you quickly summarize this again, how you model that into your model? Do you have like a special kind of symbol that you insert into your sequence to say, okay, go down or go right? And the second question then would be a follow-up question. Do you think um, introducing a reading order token or something would be sufficient to fully capture polyphony or in, in the worst case, even piano form music in such models? Thank you very much for the question. It's actually very interesting. So the first part of the question, uh, um, I have to excuse myself because I kind of went over it uh, way too quickly. The idea is that every symbol, once it's um, decomposed into its, um, compose into its components, um, you're going to have an epsilon token, which delimits its, its, its duration. And in the same way that you can have an epsilon symbol that delimits hor uh, like, uh, uh, the end of a column symbol, you can also have like an epsilon vertical, uh, vertical epsilon symbol that delimits stuff that can be in parallel on top of each other. We have found that this model can perform well, especially in printed scores, uh, even with polyphony. However, we have not tackled the problem of polyphony on, on handwritten scores yet. In terms of how uh, the model in general tackles the whole directionality and all of that, it is learned implicitly. So um, it is up for debate um, yeah, if other notations can have other advantages or disadvantages compared to ours. Because for instance, we can have uh, symbols like slurs that uh, technically in our point of view, we put the opening of the slur in, in, on top of a symbol. But um, the way uh, handwritten uh, music uh, works, sometimes it's not perfectly on top. So maybe the fact that uh, it's not well correlated. Um, so the fact that we impose this notation and then the model doesn't see a clear correlation might influence it, for instance. So uh, in summary, I think there is a lot that can be investigated in terms of how to make other notation systems, perhaps graphs, perhaps, I don't know, other roads for this, but um, I can talk that this notation does give good results for the most part and can be exploited very well. Thank you very much. You're welcome.